I want to begin today with how I begin many of the classes that I teach there is with a brief practice of arriving. So if you don't mind, put down whatever you're doing, sit back, put your feet flat on the floor. Find a position in which you're seated that balances both comfort and dignity. So you're comfortable, but yet upright in your chair. And really find a way to sit in a manner that you can relax as many muscles as possible without falling out of the chair and maintaining that upright posture. And if you're comfortable with it, you can close your eyes, but if you don't want to close your eyes, you can keep those open and just gaze out in front of you uh, about where you would have a book. And if the eyes are closed, do a check and make sure you're not squinting, you're not pressing those eyes tightly closed. Check with the eyebrows, make sure they're relaxed, and even check with your jaw. And, and you might find that your teeth can drop open a slight bit. And of course, check in with your shoulders. Ask yourself, what are my shoulders doing right now? We often carry much of the tension of our day in our shoulders. And when we check in with them, we can give ourselves permission to let our shoulders drop. And then just expand that awareness to the entire body, recognizing what it feels like to sit in the chair right where you are. Can you feel the chair underneath you? And down into your feet, can you feel the floor underneath your feet? Can you feel the floor and the chair holding you up and gravity gently holding you down? And coming to the realization that if those two things are working together, the floor, the chair, and even gravity, at this moment you have absolutely nothing you have to do but just be. Take a moment to take a deep breath in. And as you exhale, let the body drop in to right where it is. Give yourself permission to arrive where we are now, letting go of everything that's come before, everything that will come later, and just give yourself permission to be here now. Take another deep breath in. And as you exhale this time, just gently let the eyes open if they were closed. And transition not from being mindful to mindless with the eyes open, just add the sense of sight if you had them closed to your field of awareness and continue that practice of presence throughout. And I'd recommend throughout the presentation, hopefully I don't do anything to stress you out, but just ask yourself, what are my shoulders doing? And it's amazing how our shoulders sometimes go back up to our ears and we don't even know it. And it's just, oh yeah, I noticed that, let them go and the domino effect that happens with the body that follows. And as I said, that's often how I start some of my classes. The school I teach at uh, collegiate school is here in Richmond. It's uh, JK through 12 co-ed day school. Um, and I arrived at collegiate as uh, um, one of my main roles there was the boys varsity basketball coach. I'd coached in college for a while uh, down at Walford College in South Carolina and, and find the opportunity to have my own program as a head coach. And I had found mindfulness by reading about Phil Jackson and the Bulls back when I was a kid. And so I, this has been a practice for me since I was 15 and I finally had my own team. I said, work for the Bulls, we're gonna do it. But it was 2004, so I didn't call it mindfulness. I called it sports psychology. Right, because mindfulness in 2004 would have been weird to a lot of people, and it's not, it's not. But it is so much about performance, and what I say to our kids all the time is, it, it, I talk about performance, but you don't have to be an athlete. You can be an actress, an actor, or your performance may be your ability to fall asleep at the end of the day. When you put your head on your pillow, Falling asleep is a performance. Tasting your dinner is a performance. Taking a test is a performance. And performance ultimately comes out of presence. And certainly that's what we're trying to do with mindfulness is practice that presence. So I brought it to the basketball team. We did it as a form of sports psychology. Uh, and, and basically right around the same time, a few years into it, um, the up high school department chair for our health and wellness program in the, in the high school happened to call around to a few colleges that a lot of our kids attend and just said, hey, what if college freshmen need the most? Every college said, stress management. Please help these children. 
And, and that wasn't unique to us. That was, it was speaking in reference to any college freshman. And so she came to me and she said, all right, we have a health and wellness curriculum, you know, drug ed, sex ed, driver's ed, all these things. We want to give you two weeks and I want you to do whatever you're doing with your basketball team, do it for our freshmen in two week chunks. And so that's really how it began. Well, it started with basketball, but other people started coming to me saying, what are you teaching them? How do you do that? Again, about how do you handle adversity? How do you handle success? How do you maintain resilience? How do you just enjoy what you're doing? And so we started this stress management class. Again, didn't call it mindfulness, called it stress management. Um, in about 2007, where we taught every single freshman uh, at our school in two week chunks at about 15 to 20 kids at a time throughout the year. So I would just rotate through the classes. And uh, as that went on, basically, as I said, what I had followed was uh, from a young age was the Bulls and their success and had known that the Bulls and Phil Jackson ultimately were introduced to it through uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who Dr. Brewer was mentioning earlier. So much of what I had been practicing was based on what was happening at UMass. So I created, as you know, Kabat-Zinn's MBSR programs eight weeks, once a week, um, and I got two weeks. And uh, usually that would add up to eight or nine days based on how our schedule rotated. Well, I thought like Bruce Lee and said, okay, let's be like water and take the shape of the vessel we're given. Because in schools, you are limited in time and space. So I didn't have eight weeks. I had two weeks. So I took the eight-week program and put it into eight days, essentially. But it wasn't... Uh, feeding them the whole bottle of penicillin. It was done, I hope, with wisdom and with what I would call translation into high school uh, semantics. And so being very aware of not necessarily just reading scripts because those kids would have rolled their eyes at some of them because that's right for some but not for them. And so really knowing who they were was important and being able to speak in a way that didn't terrify them as to what we were going through. And, and so they dove right into it. A lot of people say, how do you teach kids this? Well, it's innate to kids. It's, it's I hate to say it, education and society that sometimes sucks it out of us because we perpetually are looking at outcomes rather than what we're doing in this moment. And realizing what we do in this moment determines our outcomes. So teaching them that, yes, you can dive fully into this moment and have success as a result. And so beginning that uh, first year of it, we had great success, did freshman and sophomore that year to get two grade levels, and from then on did freshman every year. And all of a sudden, you know, little apprehension and fear. Again, we did, I did talk about it being mindfulness within the class. I never used the word meditation again because that was 2007. Now we can use that word freely. Our athletes were doing yoga, but we were calling it stretching. Um, and again, now that's fully accepted where we can say these words. Thank goodness, thanks to the research that's been presented today, that's why. And so uh, after that first year, all of a sudden the teachers wanted it. The uh, parents wanted it. And out of fear of what I thought, people say, get rid of that thing. All of a sudden, more want it. So I went to school. I said, look, it's taking hold. Can I please go get some real training? So I was able to go up and get some professional training uh, through the Center for Mindfulness um, under the direction of uh, John kabat and Saki Santorelli and brought, again, that back, that knowledge back to begin professional development programs for our faculty, all voluntary, very important. Something I want to emphasize in regards to the uh, delivery of this to our school is, for our faculty has been every couple years I offer something and make sure it's voluntary. I'm um, not going to cram a faculty member in there who doesn't want to be in there. For the kids, they have to take it their freshman year. Um, but what I say is, look, you have no homework other than obviously paying attention. Uh, you have no tests because that would cause stress, not relieve stress. And the real stress test is ultimately what life brings us. Um, and and you, you, you don't have to take notes. If there's something you wish you wrote down, just email me later. And so they feel this immediate liberation. Hopefully it gets them on the first day. Sweet, I like the class. But they started practicing. They started practicing, again, at home. Their parents, I would have them with the mindful eating, you know, take a bite, put down the fork, chew, swallow. Guess what the parents would say? What's wrong with you? <laughs> when we slow down to eat, something must be wrong with you or the food. No, we're enjoying our food. And so then the parents wanted that, as I said, and we started parent workshops. The first one we did was three hours and 75 parents showed up. 74 of them were moms. 
Um, so the moms came to me and said, please do something for the dads. And so the middle school counselor had the idea, let's do, I think it was like 7 a.m. donuts with dads. They'll come for donuts. And 60 of them showed up the first time we did that and did it again for the second year about mindfulness and mindful parenting and just mindfulness in general for uh, dads. And um, have done, as I said, professional development for the teachers so that they can have this opportunity to bring it to their classroom. But one of the most important things we emphasize is don't you dare bring this to your classroom if you don't have this practice for yourself. We would never ask a teacher to teach a student the violin without knowing how to play the violin. Don't go memorize a script. Don't go memorize a book. Don't pull something off the shelf. Use those as resources because they're ample and they feed us, and that's what I've been doing since I was 15. But all of it's irrelevant if I don't have my own practice. Your practice informs you as much as anything, and it attunes you to the people you're sitting across when leading them through the practice. And so, uh, thankfully, our school has supported this over the years, and I want to emphasize this has been a 13-year growth that started with basketball, three years later turned into freshmen. But if you can think of a pebble hitting the pond and the ripples going outward, we're now doing it in some fashion, junior kindergarten through 12th grade. But that took 13 years. We didn't flip a switch. And, and what we've done is, uh, you know, the school counselors at each division of the lower elementary school, the middle school, and the high school uh, have some knowledge base of it and so that we're able to incorporate it into counseling and classroom guidance. But then also some teachers. When a teacher wants it, if they really want to get into it, the mindful schools that Kirk mentioned earlier, we can do online training for them. The school will provide it, and those teachers can bring it to their classroom. But they have to prove they have a practice for themselves first rather than just trying to wing it. We do our best that we're not pushing play on an audio program in a classroom setting that the teacher has their own practice that they can deliver uh, to the students. Because with kids, and we all know this in here, man, they sniff out all inauthenticity a mile away. And if it ain't right for you, it's not going to feel right for them. And so it's such an important thing to establish that practice if you want to bring this to students. Um, and, and again, so the evolution continued. It's now become a part of uh, our advisory program in the middle school, which is essentially like homeroom for us. It's uh, uh, incorporated in different realms in the lower school. And I can speak more to the high school where we have it in health and wellness retreat days for the sophomores and juniors where they get a reminder of it in a single day uh, with guided practices. Um, and then also that freshman year. And also I have teachers. You know, I have a teacher who's teaching like an English teacher who's teaching Walden. And he's like, we just finished Walden. Can you come do a meditation for us? Yes. Or a math teacher saying, oh my gosh, you're so stressed out. Can you please come today? And that's an awareness and attunement to what the students need. I uh, work with all the coaches and when they want it. And this year, football team won the state championship. And those guys said, we want you to come in Friday before the state championship. And Saturday morning, we want you before, I think it was a noon game, we want the football team wanted it prior to playing the state championship. And... And that's what's been formed for me. Again, back to performance. I mean, my first three years at Collegiate, I had a point guard on our basketball team by the name of Russell Wilson, who's now the quarterback for the Seahawks. And he's brought mindfulness to the Seahawks. And, and now it's part of what the Seahawks do, including yoga and mindfulness. Um, and also another student I work with, and all these students give me permission to talk as I mentioned, more anecdotal than research-based from what we're doing. Uh, uh, current starting quarterback at the University of Michigan I've worked with since middle school because he also played basketball. And he came to me almost uh, weekly, if not uh, sometimes it would be just monthly, but football season would pick up a bit. And he established a mindful practice for himself, what he attributes uh, to his success uh, at, at University of Michigan now. And, and one of the things to try to teach the kids in that class, as well as all the notions that come from MBSR, is is to make it attainable to them. And I thought back to what John Kabat-Zinn taught so many doctors of how, you know, if you don't have time to go meditate and sit or body scan for 20 minutes in between surgeries, what, what do you already do that you can meditate on? And he always talked about, you know, scrubbing in. A doctor is going to scrub in before surgery. Why not make that a sensory meditation? get into that zone state rather than scrubbing in thinking, oh, I hope I don't mess this up. You don't want your doctor thinking that. And so it's the ability to drop in and just feel the water, see the water, hear the sound of the water hitting the sink, and then transition into the surgery in front of you. I ask our students to come up with their own things. What is it that you do already that you can incorporate mindfulness to? And it makes it attainable to them. It makes it, for the quarterback at Michigan, he talks about what he does on the field. He has his off-the-field practice on the field in the moment. 
If he throws an interception, he can't go lay on the sideline and just meditate, and then people start throwing stuff at him. So what he's got to do is, in the moment, when he feels the tension on the field, he simply unsnaps and resnaps his helmet. He listens to the sound. He feels the texture in his fingers. And then when he gets under center, and if you don't know quarterbacks, they often lick their fingers, which may be not good hygiene, but they lick their fingers before they snap the ball. If he gets to the center and he still is feeling the tension, he turns that licking the fingers into a mindful practice. That is irrelevant without the off the field practice. So he incorporates both. So what I ask them is try to find daily reminders, including their phone. If the phone goes off, instead of immediately checking your phone, just ask yourself, the phone goes off, what are my shoulders doing right now? Oh, I'm going to relax those. I'm going to take a deep breath. Not because I'm nervous about a phone call or a text. It's a reminder that I just need to drop in. And then I check that text message. So you create randomized moments throughout the day that, are, that make sense to you. Um, one that, a lot, that I know I use that a lot of the students have chosen to use is walking through doorways. As they walk through a doorway, just kind of arriving like we did here, arriving, letting go of the rest of the day, a bit of a visualization, but also a practice of awareness of what do I feel right now? Because you think about the chaos of high school, you might break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend in the hallway and then go in and have to take a calculus test. Where is the transition in that? Where's the transition from the day into your afternoon activities or into home, depending on your home environment? And so figuring out what makes sense for them by creating a class that, as I say in the class, there is no textbook for that class because they are the textbook, each individual one, because we all know different things stress us out, so different things calm us down. Like Tarantulas stress me out. Some of you might love tarantulas. So with the reverse effect of this is something that calms you down might stress me out. And so figuring out what's right for the individual is a practice of self-awareness, really beginning with that uh, physiological state. And it's so interesting to ask a kid, what does it feel like to be stressed? And they'll say, well, anxious. I'm like, now, what does it feel? What is the physical symptom of stress? And they really struggle to answer that until we practice it. In time, they're able, and my intention is to figure out what is the first physical symptom of stress that they experience. And to then sit with it. Not fight it, not escalate it, not even try to push it away, right? Because what we resist persists. It's the ability to feel stress, be with stress, so we can let go of it with the practice that then follows. Maybe it's our feet touching the floor, it's that deep breath. Um, for Russell, what he does with the Seahawks is he goes, every stadium he goes to, um, he picks something out that's an inanimate object. Maybe it's a press box or a flag or a trash can. And when he feels tension on the field, he just takes a look at that thing, whatever he chose, and he uses sense of sight. And he takes a deep breath, he exhales, and he drops in. Remember, the quarterback of Michigan, it was the helmet because he used touch and sound. Well, touch and sound wasn't going to work for Russell. He wanted to use sight. So it's what is right for the person. You can't say, well, this worked for him, so it's going to work for you. It's what's right for you. And that's, all, that's where your own practice guides the guidance of others. Um, a downhill skier I worked with would get at the top of the hill, tap their boot before the going down. And, and what they were using was sound and the vibration. To everybody else, it looked like he's just knocking snow off his boot, right? And so that's where, again, whether it's the Wilton at Michigan or Russell or the skier, you know, especially when you have a defense against Wilton and Russell in football, when Russell looks up at something, they don't say, oh, we got him now, he's nervous. No one knows you're even doing that. As a quarterback, you unsnap your helmet, resnap it. You're not revealing all of a sudden that you're freaking out. You're adjusting your helmet. And that's important when you're dealing with teenagers because they care what other people are thinking about them. So if they can start to panic on a test and just pay attention to the pen in their hand and feel what that feels like or their feet on the floor or get up, walk out, get a sip of water, if they can do those things, all of a sudden they're liberated not only of the stress of the test, but the stress of what other people think about me because I'm just looking at my pen. And so trying to connect with the students is so important in recognizing and meeting them where they are. And that's where this ripple effect has occurred as parents have watched them succeed, teachers have watched them succeed and, and overcome failures because um, it's not all about success. It's really about what you do when things don't go right. And with that, you know, it was interesting. We had a new head of school come uh, a couple years ago, and, and, uh, and, and the, uh, you never know if someone's going to say, hey, 
what is this? We're not doing that anymore. Thankfully, he loves mindfulness and is grateful for what we do. And his question was, why is this not in every classroom and every grade? It was a great question. Everyone should have this. But again, we got to do it right before we do it quick. And so instead of just saying, all you teachers now have to learn mindfulness and you're going to do it in your classroom, I go back to what I said at the beginning. It's been this slow spreading of people who might have rolled their eyes at it the first time around. And the next couple years later, I offered again, they're in there because they were freaking at the copy machine one day because it was breaking down and the person next to them was just breathing calmly. And they wanted what they had, calmness. And, and, and so they come to it in time. And that's where, you know, I think it's so interesting hearing, I want to restate what Dr. Kelly talked about with addiction and also uh, getting into recovery. Why do people get addicted to drugs and why do people then get off of it? It's to feel good, to feel better, to do better because of others are doing it. Is that right? And to me, that's why I find it collegiate. As, as you said, that, I was like, that's why people are, are practicing mindfulness to feel good, to feel better, to do better. And sometimes it's because the person next to me is doing it. And then I start to feel those other qualities. That's an anecdotal statement, not research-based. I'm just noticing that's why people come to it. And, and um, a couple other anecdotes that's been interesting over the last, uh, again, 13 years of this is just hearing back from people who've had positive experiences from it. And it's such a realm of thing, wide range of things, whether it's public speaking on stage or, again, sports, or falling asleep at night's the main one, because they do fall asleep a lot in my class, but that's because of the body scan, and it knocks them out. And I try to make the point, if you can fall asleep flat on your back on this linoleum floor in like eight seconds, why do you toss and turn at night at home? Teach yourself at home whatever the heck you're doing here is. And so, yeah, it's the one class you're allowed to fall asleep in. The intention, as I like to say to them, though, is ultimately if we can fall awake instead of falling asleep. But you're not fighting sleep. It's the awareness of the sensation of sleep approaching as you do this. So a lot of them use this to fall asleep at night because that's something challenging for kids, whether it be stress or the phone or whatever else. But uh, another uh, kind of anecdotal story comes from a faculty member that um, some of you may know uh, here because he ended up at uh, MCV and VCU, was, had done some of the professional training for mindfulness, just thinking how he can incorporate it. He's a longtime cross-country coach and uh, teacher in the middle school. And next thing you know, his liver started to fail, and he was given seven days to live. And it took to the final hours of the seventh day before a transplant arrived, ended up receiving the oldest transplant, liver transplant in the history of liver transplants, quite a miracle performed by MCV. And coming out of that, he came back to me and said, I got to tell you, mindfulness saved my life. I was doing that to figure out how to bring it to coaching, how to bring it to classroom. When they told me I had seven days, when they told me I had a couple hours, I should have panicked. I didn't. I just sunk right into what was because I knew that if I panicked, I might kill myself. Not literally, but I might debilitate my body in the moment where my body needs to be its strongest. I needed to be strong, and mindfulness gave me the strength at the most challenging time of my life. And he's still out there teaching cross, coaching cross country and running and teaching in the middle school and volunteering at MCV with other uh, transplant uh, donors who are waiting for their donation. Um, so again, taught the teachers thinking, hey, this will be good for your class. But when someone says, this saved my life, it, it, it all of a sudden, that's an immeasurable. Another one was a student that has given me permission to talk about this. It graduated a few years ago, a couple years ago. Um, this situation happened a couple years ago uh, when she was a sophomore and she was riding a bike on spring break and got hit by a car. Um, and she, again, I teach the class freshman year. This was sophomore year of her spring break. It was a, the truck was flying. They went, whipped around to pass somebody and hit her in a crosswalk. She flew off the bike, but she was not unconscious. She said when she hit the pavement and did not lose consciousness, but had broken almost everything in her body, the first thing she did was go to mindfulness class and just start breathing. And those doctors believed that. They said to her, that may have saved your life. And then she got to the hospital, and it was three states away. She couldn't come back right away because of the situation in the, her body. Uh, her mom emailed me and said, our daughter cannot sleep. And she said she fell asleep a lot in your class. 
can you please email us a recording of the body scan so that she can finally sleep in the hospital and she finally got to sleep because of that body scan. So again, we can do a lot of stuff to measure this, but I find the anecdotal stories powerful and I just wanna end with literally the most recent one. We talk about recent research. This is my version of recent research, I guess, is when I hear back from kids. This is from a student who's about to graduate. I'll leave his name out and leave the university out, but um, it's an email from a student who just sent this to me at the beginning of this month. And I wanna remind you, he's a senior in college, so he took this class eight years ago for two weeks, an hour a day maybe. Hey, Coach Peavy, I've had stressful times in college as everyone has, but I had a cheat not many will ever have. In high school, I loved your stress management class because there was no work. I loved it because there was no tests, no assignments, and no stress. As I've gotten older, it has been my secret weapon to life's hard times. I can't remember a single test where I haven't placed my feet flat on the ground, closed my eyes, and taken a deep breath to calm my nerves. I also can't remember what it was like to fall asleep, stressed, because of your meditation steps on stressful nights. There have been points where I almost reached out to you for a recording of your exercises because they have left such a profound effect on me, one I wish to share with others. You're personally, you personally took a huge portion of stress out of my life, and not for a semester, but for the rest of my years. This seems small in the grand scheme of things to outsiders who have not suffered from anxiety. I, on the other hand, hold what you have taught me and your impact on my life in the highest regard. Because of you, I went from underperforming in life to achieving what I thought I never could. Instead of trembling and blanking out when I take tests, I attack them. I went from feeling physically ill due to anxiety to have more confidence than I probably should. I don't know if I will ever be able to put into words what that was like for me, to be able to make the transition over the years of my life with these techniques. I'll be graduating from blank as a double major in accounting and finance from one of the top 10 accounting programs in the country. When I think back to high school and how it prepared me, I owe a lot of success to this class. The most math I use is multiplication and division. The most writing I have done in one sitting in the last three years is probably this email. <laughs> but there hasn't been a week of college where I haven't used mindfulness and the techniques learned in your class, and I am forever grateful for everything you've done. I want to say that as, and it, I get choked up, sorry. The, uh, that has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the research that exists. Everything we do at Collegiate is research-based, thanks to the, all the hard work of the people that are in this room that had spoken earlier. And, and, and that's where we have the power in what we're doing. And then these kids, I don't know, I, I believe in the Zen saying, the seed never sees its flower. Well, I told him I just saw the flower. That was eight years ago. I had no idea he was even paying attention in class. And that's where I have faith in the research, I have faith in the practice, and I have faith in all the stories I've heard from so many different people of whether it's as simple as, again, taking a pop quiz in English class, saving your life or changing your life. So I hope mindfulness can be something that expands beyond just where it is now and gets into schools as much as physical education, it should be part of mindful education. And that's what I've had the opportunity to speak at schools all over town and speak at, uh, spent once a month at the juvenile correctional facility for about three years and brought some of our students with me down there to practice with them. Um, and, and work at the Cameron Gallagher Foundation where for once a month we offer mindful Mondays during the school year. And some nights 40 kids from all over the Richmond area will show up. The next week there'll be four kids, because they're kids, and you never know who's gonna show. And then there'll be 30 kids. And it's amazing the demand that's out there. The kids want this. Therapists are calling me saying, what do I do? Every kid that comes here is asking for mindful practices. There's a lot of resources out there to learn them. Most importantly, establish your own practice and then give the gift to somebody else. Thank you very much. Yeah.